Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Tehillim Treasures, sponsored by two wonderful organizations. Chazak has been providing excellent material of inspiration and Torah learning for many years, but especially the last few years where we found ourselves stuck by a computer sometimes, and Chazak was one of those organizations that stepped up to the plate and provides really endless opportunities for growth and inspiration. This is also sponsored by Chickens for Shabbos at chickensforshabbos.com. And I'd like to add, stop for a moment and imagine if you were in their shoes. A family of somebody who was an aguna, a family of somebody who was not able to make it to Grusha, or perhaps families of Malamdim that don't have the necessary funding sometimes to even put food on the table or buy shoes for their children. For $250, you can sponsor one family for a week. And let's be honest, that's not all that much money and it doesn't provide them with all that much other than the bare minimum for what they need to be able to live. Grab hold of this schus, chickensforshabbos.com. Tonight we will be learning the next two kapitlach of Tehillim, kapitel Nun Aleph and Nun Beis, chapters 51 and 52, as we continue to move forward into the second third of David HaMelech's Timeless Treasures. This capital is the capital of Bivoy Elov Noson Hanovi Kasher Bo El Basheva. It is the famous story of David and Basheva. David Amelech was Kodesh Kodoshim. He was the holiest person. He was one of the greatest people that ever lived. And yet, there was a Maisa with Basheva. There was an incident with Basheva where David Amelech sent Uriah Achiti away to war and Uriah got killed, and when he got killed, David married Bathsheba, his wife, in Uriah's place. And there were those who were suspicious of what had happened. However, the Gemara in Shabbos tells us, If you think that David HaMelech made a sin, if you think he transgressed an Avera, you are mistaken. Because David HaMelech acted with the purest of intentions. In fact, there are those who say, I believe the Ramah Mipanoi says, Ramanach Mazari Mipanoi, a Kabbalist from the 16th century, says that David and Basheva is a reincarnation of Odom and Chava. The Hainu. David HaMelech had his 70 years of life because Odom gave him his life. Adam is Rashi Teva, says the Chida, Adam, David, Moshiach. David HaMelech has no life of his own. His life is that of Adam Arishans. Chava is Nizgalgel. She is reincarnated into the soul of Basheva. In fact, Basheva is the daughter of seven, the woman who was created in the first seven days of creation. So there we have that David and Bathsheba is meant to be. It is a zivug, it is a match made in heaven. Mamish. And because of that, David HaMelech and Bathsheba were always going to be married. This is the way HaKadosh Baruch Hu orchestrated it. Nevertheless, <clears throat> Nas and Anavi came to David HaMelech. And he gave him Musa. And David HaMelech had two ways of dealing with that Musa. The truth is, is that we all have two ways with dealing with Musa. When we do something that is either wrong or is perceived to be wrong, and someone approaches us and gives us Musa for what we've done, or maybe we hear a shear, and we hear a shmooz, and it applies to us, so we can approach that Musa in one of two ways. We either can say, what are you talking about? I didn't do anything. It's not me. It's somebody else. Or we can respond how David HaMelech responded. And that is, David HaMelech responded with two words. Chotosi Lashem. 
I have sinned to Hashem, his admission of guilt, something that he learned from his Zayda, from Yehuda, where he said, Tzadka, she is righteous, Tamar, was pregnant, she was impregnated, me many, from me. It was the moment that Yehuda had earned his stripes to become the Melech of Klal Yisrael and to have Malchus come from him. And David's admission of guilt is that which really shows how worthy he is of Malchus, of being a Melech for Klal Yisrael, of caring, of putting himself last. And Gilu Kvoid Malchus Shamayim, the revelation of Hashem's presence in this world first. You know, there is a phenomenal story, and I want to tell you that when I first wrote um, the book that I wrote on Tehillim, which is called the Tehillim Treasury, or it's actually called the Touch of Tehillim, but it was, I think the articles were the Tehillim Treasury, and, and I uh, spoke to Mr. and Mrs. Jerry Walowski, and I asked them if they would uh, consider sponsoring the work. So the book wasn't finished at that time. And I wanted to give them an opportunity to look at some of the material first to decide if they'd be interested in sponsoring such a work. And they're very, very generous people. And they're interested in inspiring Yidin across the globe. And I have to show them one, two, three stories. So this story that I'm about to tell you, which appears in the book I wrote on Tehillim, this is the story that I showed them. And it's based on this capital. During World War II, Rav Shalom of Shatz, the Shatzerov, he ran away from his hometown in Romania to London, which is where he spent many, many years, the rest of his life. And when he was back in his hometown in Romania, it was what he was used to. In, Sh in Shatz, that's where the Hasidus was thriving. That's where Yidin lived a certain, with a Hasidish flavor. London was a far cry from that. And London, there were many progressive Jews at the time, and he had to change his nusach in terms of what he meant or what he emphasized in his avayda. And he would fight against the stream. He would fight against the tide and he would do everything he could to break those who were looking to, or to break the movement and to break the momentum of those who were looking to walk away from the traditions of Yiddishkeit. When he died, he was, he was buried in London. And when he was buried in London, he gave a havtocha, a promise. I was actually at his kever. And the promise is that if you go to his kever, and you accept upon yourself any Kabbalah that you will keep, mamish to the last diyuta uh, tachtoyna, the last letter of the law, then he promised he would be a melitz yosher for you and Shemayim. He would advocate on your behalf. So, a woman told me actually that she was not zeichet to children, and she was a very a woman who was very modern in her observance. She did not cover her hair. And she went to the Shatzerov's kever. Somebody said to her, are you willing to go to the Shatzerov's kever and make a Kabbalah? She said, she, this is what she told me. She said, I'll go to the moon if I have to. She went to the Shatzerov's kever. She was macabre that she would cover her hair, not just cover it. She would cover every single hair. She would never let her hair show. And she was Zoyche Baruch Hashem to a beautiful family. So, Shalom of Shatz was, was quite a very special individual. And Rav Shalom was known for, for really davening for people, and he was poil ice. He poiled ice. He accomplished on, for people's behalfs. He was an exceptional, exceptional Melitz Yosher. And one time, a family came to Rav Shalom's house. They were broken. He walked in, they walked in, and the mother was crying, and he said, what's wrong? And she said, we have a son, his name is Nachman. And he got involved with the wrong crowd. Before long, he mamish left Yiddishkeit. His non-Jewish friends convinced, convinced him to become a pilot. And he became a pilot, became a fighter pilot, and then she starts crying. 
And she says, a few days ago, the British authorities showed up to our house. And they told us that Nachman's plane was shot down. The plane exploded upon impact. And he's gone. There are no survivors. She was very, very broken. And they looked, they could not find the body in the rubble. So now she was coming to Reb Shalom of Shatz. And she said, just because he went Arab Funderech, just because he went off the path, does that mean that I don't have a right to sit Shiva on my son? And she begged Reb Shalom of Shatz to Davin that they should be Zoichet to find the body of her child. And Reb Shalom looked at her and he said, you're not going to sit Shiva for your son because your son is very much alive. That's not what she expected to hear. She couldn't believe it. And she was scared to put false hope into such a belief. Well, one week later, there was a knock on the door and her son Nachman walked in to the house and ran into his mother's arms. And he told his story. His story was that he was given a mission to bomb a German army base. He flew over, he dropped the bombs. They hit their targets, but enemy fire ripped into the wing of his plane. And the jet went into a tailspin. I knew that I was going to die. Unless I could somehow get out, I pressed the eject button I was horrified to discover that the button was jammed. It wouldn't release, and at that moment, I cried out and I said, Hashem, I know that I abandoned you, but I am begging you at this moment in time, please don't abandon me. I promise if you save me, I will change my ways. I pressed down one more time on the eject button, and lo and behold, I was jettisoned into the sky. I was saved. My parachute allowed me to land safely in trees. The jet crashed and exploded, and here I am. Everybody has challenges to admit their wrongdoing. If you're David HaMelech, you do it the first instant that you're asked. Chotas Hashem. Some of us have to go down a long journey, but we always must remember that Hashem is a Paiseach Yod Lishuva. His hands are open and He is willing to accept us at any time and any moment of our lives, even if we think it's our last one. We now move on to the 52nd chapter of Tehillim. Lamnatseach Maskil Ludovid David Amelach speaks about the bloodshed that took place in Nov. Noiv Ira Kehanim Shaul's men were running after him, and Achimelech, the Kayin Godel, saw him. He asked him why he was alone. It's a well known story. And David explained he was on a secret mission. And that's why he didn't have any men with him. Well, Achimelech gave David, who was on the verge of death from starvation and hunger, he gave him bread that was reserved for the Kehanim. Hira Shah. He gave it to him because he thought he was going to die. And he consulted the Urim Betumim, and he gave him the sword of Goliath, the archenemy of David HaMelech. Doyeg Ha'adoimi, who was a great Talmud Chacham and the head of the Sanhedrin, was in Noiv at that time. And he had to come to bring Karbonus to the Mishkan, and he witnessed the exchange between Achimelech, the Kohen Gadol, and David HaMelech. And he saw, at least what appeared to be, that Achimelech was married by Malchus. He was rebelling against the king, against Shaul HaMelech. And what did he do? He went and he told Shaul. Shaul ordered that Achimelech and the entire city of Noiv Ir HaKayanim should be killed. And when Shaul's righteous servants refused to carry out this grave injustice, 
He commanded Doyeg to kill the Kayhanim, and Doyeg, again, who was the Roisha Sanhedrin, he was the God of Hadar. He obeyed the king and he killed 85 Kayhanim. If you don't know the story, the story is shocking. If you do know the story, the story is shocking. It's one of the most tragic episodes in the life of David HaMelech. Doyega Doimi had lost his portion in Olam Haba because of this one incident. The Gemara tells us that because he spoke Lashon Hara, he lost his Olam Haba. Can you imagine somebody who's Mamish the God Hadar? And for him to lose everything that he had earned in his lifetime because he spoke Lashon Hara and this incident resulted from the tragedy. But that's what happens when people are malshin. That's what happens when people have negativity and feel negatively towards others. He could have looked at the story and he could have assumed, you know what, let me be darim l'chav schus. Let me assume that Achimelech thought that it was a hayra asha, which is really what happened. But Doeg did not make that decision. Instead, he decided to choose the negative outlook. And that, in turn, killed all of the Kayanim and hurt Doeg worst of all. You know, sometimes we are called upon to fight a milchemes Hashem against evil. And when we are asked, when the cry of Mila Shem Eli comes out, we must go guns blazing. However, we must make sure that there's no personal agenda. Because if there's anything that is tinting or tinging our outlook, tragedy can result from such an episode. There's a Gewaldige Maisa that took place with the Satmerov. The Satmerov was the Beirich Moshe, Reb Moshe Teitelbaum. And he was told that there's a small group of protesters within his Hasidus who were standing arm in arm with Palestinian forces protesting against the state of Israel. And the Satmarov believed that secular Zionism is the worst. It's the Mekor Atumah. That's what the Satmar ideology is all about. Every single time Satmar speaks, it's connected Zionism. But the Rebbe was concerned about the demonstration and he summoned those who had gone to demonstrate. He wanted to speak to them. A group of the men entered his office and the Rebbe spoke to them with a lot of passion and he said, we have to be very careful. We're fighting against Zionism, and for us, that is the Melchama Lashem. However, Hashem knows what's in our hearts. Hashem knows what we really feel. And in this case, we must hate what they stand for, but love them. You're never allowed to hate another Jew. You can fight tooth and nail against what they believe and what they hold. But you must always remember that that's where it stops. The Yid himself, the Jew himself, he you must love with all your heart. And the Berach Moshe explained that Hashem knows what's in our hearts. Hashem says that our thoughts and our Motives are really what dictate our actions. And if we chatz shalom ever will feel negatively towards another person, then even though on the outside it might appear that we're fighting Milchamet Hashem for what we believe, staunch believers in what's right, Hashem knows the truth. And if we compromise on that, then our mission is false. Until next time. Nagazant.